I don't think I've ever talked here about control systems at all. So this is be um, my first time. My coworker Gabe uh, was not able to make make it, so um, I'm stepping in for him. But we're on the same team. Um, a little bit about me, um, Chris Sistrunk. I used to work at Entergy. Um, the beginning of my career after I graduated college as an electrical engineer. Um, worked there in control systems uh, for about 10 years or so, then started falling backwards into security after Stuxnet happened. Um, and then in 2013, uh, found some major vulnerabilities in uh, some control system protocols with a colleague of mine, and then I got a job offer to work for Mandian. Um, so I think I'm still FireEye's only um, employee in the whole state of Mississippi. So um, that I try to get our, our folks to come down here and say, hey, look, we've got uh, a lot to offer here in Mississippi. So, uh, so I know some of you have probably heard of FireEye or Mandiant before. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I started B-Size Jackson in 2012, and I'm glad, I'm really happy that uh, we're still going. Um, so we're back. It feels good to be back. Uh, big, big props to Lisa. So um, um, it, it takes a lot of work, a lot of work behind the scenes to make a conference like this happen, even at the last minute. So uh, it's there's a lot to do. Uh, I, I I did it for five years by myself, and I knew that if if it was just me doing it, um, if I moved away or something like that, it might not ever keep happening. So uh, we wanted to change that a couple years ago. Someone else took it over, and then um, we weren't able to have enough uh, support last year, but we're back this year. Lisa, she stepped up big time, but we have all these other stuff. Tween, she's out there uh, with the registration table. She also came up with a cool graphic that was used to help promote the event. Um, Joe Gray, who doesn't live here, but he helped with other B-sides, uh, and he volunteered to help with, with us. Um, Shane Adams is here. Uh, Russell George, who just left. Uh, Matthew Harrison for helping uh, bring it back here because um, we couldn't do it without his help in uh, the, the, the whole building here. That's where he works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then uh, Bruce uh, for his efforts with the ISC Square, uh, getting that off the ground. I mean, this is really what it's about. So, um, yay. <laughs> um, so, what I'm here to talk about is control systems, um, but it really boils down to heroes. And I want to talk about heroes. Uh, anybody ever heard of uh, Randy Pausch or Pausch, however you say it? He wrote the book uh, The Last Lecture. He had a, a terminal disease and he was a professor of engineering. And this last lecture was he knew he was going to die and he gave his uh, best advice to his students about engineering. So, one of his quotes that I really love engineering isn't about perfect solutions, it's about doing the best you can with limited resources. So doing the best you can with what you have at the time. A lot of us in security often have that. We don't have the best budgets in the world often, um, so we have to make do. Uh, we have to be like my guy on our best days, you know, create a submarine with a paper clip. Um, <laughs> or, you know, this tiny piece of code we were able to, uh, without costing anything as open source software, we were able to push something like Security Onion out to get visibility on our networks um, and help find an attack before it really got worse. Um, on our um, worst days, you know, uh, we made that uh, firewall change at 5 o'clock on Friday, which shut the plant down for a couple of days. Um, that actually happened. I was there with a customer of ours that they made a simple firewall change and it shut their uh, manufacturing plant down. Um, so, you know, oops, well, we have that. Um, we have circumstances outside of our control, like Mother Nature and people, like, being born. Okay, I can't just come to work and now have a, a human to take care of. Or, uh, you know, other people, someone hit me on the way to work, you know. So, life happens. 
So, and, and some people in security feel like that they have uh, to be the hero um, all the time, but the world still revolves even if you're not at work. And hopefully you can set up uh, some things um, when you are heroes, when you're lifting um, cars off of others, you know, talking about doing incident response, you're helping uh, fix a problem or um, saving your manager's butt by coming up with this great solution that um, he really had a problem for. Um, we, we need to be able to innovate. And our, these heroes often, if, you know, if you've ever had um, an incident response, you, you find these people just step up out of the woodwork, just like during a hurricane. Uh, you know, Hurricane Katrina, people just came up, like, after all these recent hurricanes, you have all the, the Cajun, the Cajun Navy, right? Uh, people just step up and be heroes. That's what we're talking about here. So, you know, someone said, well, I want to make a grill. Now, well, it still works. Um, anybody familiar with NotPatia? Um, yeah. uh, this is an article from Wired, um, if you follow the, um, uh, the link there. Anybody familiar what happened with um, Maersk, the shipping company, when they got hit by Not Yeah. Um, yeah. For those that don't know, um, basically the, this fake ransomware that was just disguised as ransomware was destructive, wiped all their machines. One uh, of their remote sites, and this is a big shipping company, they have shipping all over the world. One of their remote sites had a power outage, so their domain was down, and they didn't get affected. So they had one copy of a domain controller, <laughs> and they had to make a copy of that. They had to get on a plane, and they met in the middle. One of the people from the remote site didn't have a visa to get to the UK, so they met in the middle of the airport, handed on the backup tape, and because of that effort and others of the heroes that they had, they reimaged like 70,000 of their machines in 10 days. Wow. On top of maintaining their shipping manifests like 80 to 70 to 80% on time delivery while everything else was down and being rebuilt. So their engine response plan was phenomenal. And to be able to go from no network to, to back to normal in 10 days is uh, incredible. So that's the kind of heroes. We need to be able to codify what your heroes do. So after an event happens, write down what they did. Try to remember it because, you know, it might be helpful. It might happen again. Someone else, it might happen. So that's just a little um, story about heroes, um, something, that, uh, something I think you can take away. So we're here to talk about industrial control systems. Um, anybody here work with control systems all or have it at their businesses? Okay, a lot of companies um, have control systems and you don't even know it. Um, most of the time, the way things are made, uh, you know, gidgets and widgets, um, the, the IT department exists because they need to have email and businesses because they want to sell hammers or um, uh, you know, cars or whatever they're making, even, you know, all again. So just think about it. Anything that's made, manufactured, everybody watched how it's made, mm -hmm. you know, all those things. The IT uh, exists because of those things are being made. So we have electricity. It's everywhere. It's been around since the, you know, 1880s, right? It's uh, part of not only our, um, you know, it's nice to have, now it's a need. So it's, it's a necessity for most people in the world. Um, you have water. Um, most of the time you can turn on your faucet and you have an option between hot and cold water. There's still people that um, in other countries that don't even have clean water. So the, the things that go on behind the scenes um, to make water flow to just about anywhere, in, in, in the U.S. anyway, uh, in most developed countries is a phenomenon that's wonderful that we have. We can just say, hey, I need some water. Here it is. Uh, control systems help make that happen. And then you have oil and gas. Um, <laughs> uh, I pick a funny picture. Uh, you know, someone uh, decided to run away without taking the gas uh, out of their tank. Uh, 
<laughs> but you know, things like oil and gas, um, getting it out of the ground and into your tank, there's a lot that goes on between that and control systems is part of that. Well, you know, first of all, control systems exist because of what happened after the Industrial Revolution. We wanted to make things more the same, but back in the old days, you had people that did that, and you had assembly lines that people manned. But if you do some studies of in the you know Industrial Revolution, and even in what Ford started, they started studying safety. Uh, people started getting hurt more. I mean, back in the old days, the safety wasn't a big key thing. Uh, let's build some giant, enormous thing like the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, how many people died building the bridge? How many people died or got hurt or got their fingers smashed? So they said, okay, let's inject some automation to reduce the amount of safety issues. Uh, robots don't um, complain about smoke breaks or you know having to take vacation and they produce similar work um, so the quality is the same um, from car to car or whatever they're building uh, with all this automation you know they just shifted jobs from people working on cars now to people programming these robots and programming the automation in. so that that is a key thing that has shifted um, and now things are going from analog. So here's an old um, uh, control system uh, for maybe railway lines or subway. I think this is a railroad. Um, and they have these mechanical switches that, that actually send the electrical signal out wires that actually change the switch position on the track. Um, actually, up until a couple years ago, uh, some subway lines are still electromechanical. If there's a video on YouTube about um, New York MTA in London, uh, but MTA for sure, they still refurbish the old electromechanical parts that were 100 years old because they hadn't had a chance to upgrade those lines. <laughs> there's a pretty good video about that whole uh, electromechanical refurbishment department. But now it's all digital. So going from uh, analog to digital, the, the function is still the same. Uh, when you uh, see a, a screen uh, of the track and the switch position, uh, they can send a command. Uh, now it just goes in a, in a different path, maybe over a fiber signal or a radio signal. Um, because business is the way they are, uh, upper management wants to know more about their control system so they can make more money. Uh, they want to learn about what's tomorrow's production going to be. So by doing that, we take something that did not used to be connected um, to any type of network at all, but now they want to get some visibility so the engineers can do data trending. So now they connect the, uh, in, in this part of the network, uh, the control system here. They're connecting this up to the, um, uh, the, the business network. And this is the best case scenario. See, this actually has some firewalls in place and some segmentation. Um, but in reality, it's probably a flat network, especially for the ones that are not regulated or have a security budget or security team. Um, that I've worked with uh, clients that have had both. I've had very good segmentation, but also work with um, an InfoSec team at a um, oil and gas company that they it was a giant flat network um, they had firewalls but they had many any any rules in their firewall so it's effectively a flat network mm -hmm. and the three folks that worked there they were basically firefighters they were putting out fires all the time because they couldn't get ahead of the security issues um, also we have uh, in the past and and still continuing today well engineers will why do I need to drive two hours to get to uh, this substation or this pump station or whatever? Well, let's be able to remote into it from my house. Um, my father he worked for the power company, still still does. I remember when I was a child, if there was a power outage at Entergy, um, back then it was an LPNL, MPNL days, um, 
the, the operation center would call him in the middle of the night, oh, we have a power outage, he would dial in with his modem to the relay at that substation and find out where the fault was and say, oh, it's about five miles from this point. And then he would go back to bed, he'd tell the operations crew, that's where they would go find uh, the tree or the lightning strike or whatever happened. Um, so it was really convenient for this remote access. Um, and, you know, convenience is obviously the opposite of security. So a couple years ago, uh, a friend of mine on Twitter, his name is uh, Viss, uh, uh, Dan Tendler, he found this, he's like, what is this? Uh, it's, a, it's a dam over in Europe, and it was just on the internet. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, and you could see it's um, in French, and you could see the, the megawatts and the, the, the flow rates and the temperatures. Actually, yeah, it's uh, 1.152 uh, megawatts on one of the, one of the turbines. Um, and then you, everybody's heard of Shodan, right? Or hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, my friend John Matherly, he, a couple years ago, uh, some of us control system folks, we gave him some tips on uh, control system protocols and he added those to Shodan. So imagine like um, a ping or a who is, uh, but in using those control system protocols. So this one is using, um, 44818, which is Ethernet IP, and there's a command that um, engineers develop in Ethernet IP to say, who, what are you, PLC, and it'll respond with uh, Rockwell Automation, here's a serial number device type. So there was, at the time I took this screenshot, there were 9,402 of these uh, Rockwell PLCs uh, that talk Ethernet IP on the internet. Um, it, it changes, it can go up or down. So that might be due to a lack of education about security or they just don't know the issues around um, configuring their devices properly. Um, they might not care. They may actually want it to be on the internet. Uh, so engineers <coughs> uh, will need some uh, education and I believe uh, I'm an engineer. Uh, engineers are not dumb when they understand the importance of security. Um, uh, it's important that they'll, they'll make those changes, those behavior changes from ease of use to let's lock it down and keep it away. Um, now there's apps. Um, this is, I just did a Google search uh, in Google Play on my bus. Tons of apps. Uh, so. Uh, I, I, there's a story of a colleague of mine, uh, they supported, did IT support for someone who had a glass manufacturing plant, small little facility though, not a very large one, and for Christmas he got a iPad and found out that the Siemens PLC software was on, uh, on iPad, so he put it on there and he was playing around with it, you know, like a kid after Christmas, right? And uh, he made a change and then, oops, it messed up one of the configurations and he didn't have any backups of the PLC. So the, the, uh, the person that was doing the IT support was like, when was the last time we did backups? Three years ago. What? So they had to spend some considerable amount of time recreating what they did just because of the curiosity of the, uh, having those apps on an you know, iPad. Um, when we, a lot of people talk about enterprise security, a lot of times they just mean only the IT part. Um, uh, I, when I talk about enterprise security, I, call, I care about the whole enterprise. So it includes operational technology, which is the control systems, anything that relate to like building automation, elevators, escalators, HVAC, um, all the way down to PLC. So I care about both of those. So. Beware of vendors that might say, hey, we do enterprise security. Well, no, you only do the cloud. Cloud doesn't exist really in control systems. It's beginning to, but again, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, people see, are familiar with the, the triad, mm -hmm. CIA triad? Mm -hmm. Flip that upside down for control systems because most of the time, the plant manager wants that plant up 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. And he can tell you, he or she can tell you, uh, how many dollars 
per minute <laughs> when that plant goes down, when they're not making products. So availability is king. Um, also, uh, integrity is also important. If the operators can't trust what they see on the HMI screens, then they'll go operate in manual mode if they have to. Um, so they, the integrity is still important. Confidentiality, not so much. Now there are some um, control systems where confidentiality is important, like where they're making secret recipes of different chemicals, things like that. It might be proprietary, but uh, kilowatts, volts, amps, those things aren't generally proprietary and a lot of the designs are the same around the world. Um, so that's something to think about. Some of the security challenges that we face, uh, most of the time, uh, the environments don't change very often. Um, you buy the equipment, you're going to leave it there for 20 years. I had equipment at Intergy when I, at the time. It may not be that way now. I've been gone almost six years. But there, there were equipment there that was for the control system that had been installed in the mid-70s. And they were not replaced because they still worked. And so uh, the vendor is long out of business. Um, a lot of times you can only make a change when there's an outage at the plant. So uh, many uh, manufacturers have an annual plant shutdown, you know, where they shut the mill down for a month, do all their maintenance, and then go back. So maybe that's the only time you can make any changes at all to the system. And you might have some old equipment around because, you know, that investment still works or the... Um, Vendor doesn't exist anymore, and that's the only thing we haven't had a budget approved to get an upgrade. Um, the next one is domain specific technologies. A lot of times, um, the control system stuff is proprietary. So, if you go slap a Cisco, whatever it is, in, in a control system, it's not going to be able to parse all those control system protocols. <laughs> They're starting to, but you know. Five, ten years ago, that wasn't even possible. You had to have control system specific technologies um, with, like, um, even network security monitoring. Um, there, there's not very many control system protocols that are parsed with modern IT networks um, uh, technologies. Uh, IDSs, IPSs. It's starting to change, but again, it's uh, slow. Again, I, I make the joke about the cloud. Bring your own SCADA cloud, you know. Uh, that's not really happening. I will say it's being considered for uh, some things in control system world, but generally you have physical processes that have to be controlled locally. Uh, valves, things like that. Um, so by nature, it has to be on-premise. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is significant deficiencies in products and standards. So... Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Reed Wyman, coined the term forever day because uh, a control system might have a vulnerability that was put in by design um, that was a feature. Uh, because back in 20 years ago, no one ever thought people would be attacking control systems. Why would you ever want to do that? Um, and so the control system protocols or have no security, uh, no authentication, no encryption. If you're on the network and you can talk to those devices with that protocol, it's over with. So those are uh, for, uh, forever vulnerable things. Also too, some of the control system manufacturers say, well, we'll just stop making that product, you have to go buy our new one. But so all the people that have these uh, devices, um, they're uh, well, we're stuck until we upgrade and may not make enough to upgrade. Um, so that's just a couple of the, the challenges that we face. Uh, here's a scientific guess. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in control systems, lots of engineers, um, lots of technicians, lots of operators. A couple years ago, Corey Scott with LinkedIn did a, a, a something at RSA. He said there's about 189,000 professionals active in information security positions worldwide. That's grown since then. I guarantee it has. But so this is a 2015 number. So I, I said, okay, maybe 200,000 people that do security. Um, where that intersects with 
control systems, you know, there might be about 2,000 of us. You know, it's growing. It's growing. Like people that do that as their primary job. So is that is one point one? You know, is one percent of security enough to help protect critical infrastructure? You know, so think about that. I'll, if you're in regular IT security, uh, keep this in the back of your mind because you may have to help out the engineers. Um, oh, and one of the things I, I'll be right back. I've got a little prop I got to go get. Um, hold on. One of the best things to do to help with your engineers. Is go go take go to Krispy Kreme and go down to the engineers and the operators and say, hey, tell me your um, you know what your pain points are. Tell me what your problems are. Every time you make a network change, it does this to my equipment. You know, find some common ground with engineers. Um, it's really really important that you do that. Same way, I tell engineers. Go buy a case of Red Bull and go take it to your IT security team <laughs> and, 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 and do the reverse. We need to have some cross-pollination between IT security folks and engineers. Uh, I've uh, published a couple of uh, talks in the past uh, about this. I believe at B-Sides Augusta and RSA, I, talk, I talked about how to get into ICS security, and I go from, if you're coming from IT or engineering. So go check those out. Uh, they're on my uh, LinkedIn page or my SlideShare page as well. And on YouTube, I believe, for B-Sides Augusta. So there's a evolving threat landscape that's starting to target control systems. Uh, oh boy. You know, uh, we have people that are uh, humans behind keyboards, that are being paid by government entities or nation states or even uh, groups that are targeting control systems. Um, in the last, and since, you know, Stuxnet is the thing that changed everything for us. Um, 2010 is when it was discovered, it was actually in play before then. Um, we saw a gigantic amount of security research happening after that, including myself. Um, I was scared and excited at the same time. Uh, I started researching at the power company, what would be the Stuxnet that would affect me? Um, in 2014, there was two more control system specific malware that came out, Black Energy 2 and HabX. Uh, that actually use control system uh, software or protocols. Um, fast forward to 2015, uh, we had the Ukrainian uh, cyber tech, again, uh, the, their Ukrainian power grid. Three companies had their power shut off um, because an attacker uh, went after these companies, were able to log in remotely there was no multi-factor authentication, it was single factor, and they pivoted all the way to the control system by using the remote access software, like remote Windows assistance. And so there's a video on YouTube showing the Ukrainian operator seeing the mouse move around. And they would just click on the breakers and say open. So there's really no malware involved with that part of it. They were using the features of the control system. Um, that scared me. And it made me also very mad. Um, it also happened again in 2016. So they wrote malware to do it this time, and it affected one control system. December 2016 is uh, crash override. Uh, some uh, ESET called it end destroyer. And then uh, in 2017, we had um, Triton. Some people call it Trisis. Uh, US government calls it Hatman. It went after safety controllers. So in control systems, there's a primary control system. And if it's a dangerous process or there's dangerous chemicals or like nuclear or others, um, if the primary control system fails, they have to have a safety system to ensure, you know, the safe shutdown of the process. And there's also physical controls as well. So like pop-off valves, safety tank overflows, things like that. 
uh, an attacker wrote malware that went after the safety system, uh, which is never seen before. And why would you want to target that? You want to actually affect the safety of the system. So that's really um, something that has alarmed all of us. I'm, I wanted to throw one thing out there. I, you might know more about it than I do, but uh, not that yet actually hit Chernobyl as kind of collateral damage. Yes. It's radiation monitoring, I think is what it affected. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I actually have that in another slide uh, showing some of the things that were happening. But you can see here's some um, research that some of the, the, our Intel team at Fire, they were tracking control system vulnerabilities. And there was a few in 2008, 2010, but after that, boom, um, that's when the control system vulnerability research really went off. It's, um, it's incredible. Uh, basically, the way I used to pen test control systems, you push all the buttons, and that's what would happen. Um, it's, uh, it was that easy. It's getting better. A lot of the control system vendors are having uh, CERT teams now. They have starting to bake security into their products and their recommendations, which is it's helpful. But we still have a long way to go. We still have a lot of uh, control systems out there that uh, are not regulated. They don't have a security team, and they're just lucky uh, that uh, they haven't been affected. So breaking down some of the threat groups, and I actually have uh, the not Patria, uh in, in the network attack category, but you have we still have nuisance attacks like Conficker and uh, Ramnet and some of these Windows-based attacks uh, that affect control systems. So uh, just imagine an old platform in the Gulf that was built in you know the mid 2000s. They still have an upgraded equipment. A vendor comes in, flies in on a helicopter, does their upgrades to the software with USB stick. Boom, they get Configure because their laptop doesn't have any antivirus on it, or they don't scan it, and they just spread it around. Um, I have colleagues in the Gulf of Mexico that work for oil and gas companies that's had that happen. Uh, I've worked with some companies myself that we've seen it. So that's still an issue, but it's not targeted. Uh, where we see some targeted attacks, um, Intelvent was a control system security company, uh, a control system vendor. Um, in 2012, they had their source code stolen by, um, um, you know, like Chinese or some other government uh, stole their um, stole their uh, uh, software because they didn't want to have to uh, invent it themselves. Mm -hmm. And they and we see this again and again in reports where uh, nation states hack into something, steal information, and so they can benefit. Um, the next one is cybercrime, uh, credit card. You know, those you work in banks, you know all about this. Uh, we do have see it coming towards control systems, so we're starting to see some ransomware hits in control system uh, owners. So maybe it affects their IT department. Uh, a group that we track called Fin10 is a financial group. Uh, they went after Canadian mining companies and uh, held, um, and they they got in met several and they tried to hold them and say, hey, we have your data. And uh, that was quite an interesting thing. Uh, we have a really nice blog post about that if you want to do more research. WannaCry, everybody remember WannaCry? Mm -hmm. Effective control systems around the world because there was no segmentation. Uh, Locker Goga, same thing. Um, activism, we're not really seeing a lot of activism in control systems. Uh, we see a lot of activism going after like pipeline companies and uh, oil companies and nuclear companies uh, because of environmentalists, right? Uh, well, we have seen a couple of um, anonymous style operations uh, announced on Twitter and on um, you know, the, the dark web saying we're going to go after these companies um, politically. And then the last one is most visible is the network attack, uh, Triton, Stuxnet, Crash Override, Not Picture. All those have affected uh, control systems. So. You know, attack lifecycle 
you know, begins with the breach, but we we want to go before that. You know, we can see uh, network scans happening of control system uh, protocols. Like even with uh, the good guys are doing, like with Shodan, they're putting that out. Where if you have anything on the internet, it's going to be scanned no matter what. So the recon of doing, um, you know, looked in on your LinkedIn, look at your LinkedIn, see who works where, who has what control system equipment, uh, what types. Uh, we've even found uh, anonymous FTP drives that had control system data. So the, the recon, even before the breach happens, is getting easier and easier to do. Uh, but, you know, as we get through an attacker life cycle, where they compromise the system, establish a foothold, C2 channels, escalate privileges, doing internal recon, we've added another uh, component to that for control systems. They want to pivot to the control systems, exfiltrate any information out, decide what they want to do. Do they want to shut down the plant? Do they want to steal information from it? Do they want to damage the company in any way? So when you do your threat modeling at your plant, uh, your companies that uh, if you have IT and OT, make sure you include OT in your threat models and when you do your uh, attack uh, scenarios because it's very possible that they could be going after your OT and you don't even know it. Some of the common attack vectors, you know, obviously it's on the internet, <laughs> easy peasy for an attacker. Uh, inspected USBs, another way. Uh, it's either you know, on purpose or by mistake, you know, that uh, Windows type malware can spread easily that way. Spear phishing is another one we're seeing a, a big uptick in in the last several years where they're targeting engineers. They're targeting uh, control system operators. Uh, there was a couple of years ago, 2017, a campaign where they were targeting um, network or control system engineers at nuclear plants. And they would put in a fake uh, resume that was, had some macros enabled in it. And we had several clients uh, that we know of uh, and other nuclear plants that had people click on them, but you know it was shut down. The, uh, the, their control systems were not even affected because it was on the IT part. They were getting the email, so their email detection caught it. And then the last, um, is you know watering hole attacks uh, where engineers go to get valid software or go to forums things like that we're seeing that happen um, uh, mm -hmm. the, if it, is anybody familiar with the miter attack framework excellent resource uh, we're even using it at FRI to put in our blog posts we're mapping all of those attacks to the attack framework <laughs> now there uh, is coming soon there's an ICS component to that that they're going to be publishing soon. Yes, sir. Water and hole, are you talking about the uh, supply chain vulnerability? Water and hole usually means something different in other contexts. So, in this case, this is with Havex malware. Uh, they uh, uh, infected three different manufacturers, Trojanizer software, without them knowing about it. So, engineers are just going uh, to they think they're going to be getting the good software from the website, from the website okay. but, but it's not. It's, it's Trojanized. Uh, there's been other watering hole style attack storage controls, but the main one I was referencing is the Havex yeah. style. So, <coughs> so yeah, in this context, it is um, usually it's called the supply chain vulnerability. But, okay. Thank yeah. You. Uh, well, there's. Uh, supply chain is um, a big concern in control systems, especially um, with components not made in the U.S. for those who have companies in the U.S. So, you know, software supply chain. Yeah, so, yeah, ha, yeah, yeah, software and yeah, and and hardware as well, because you know, going through the vetting process um, is now more important. Now, even ICS vendors are starting to. Make sure that they have hashes, and does the hash match? And actually, they have software that checks that for you before it will actually run. So they're starting to do that. And uh, five years ago, they didn't have that. Ten years ago, definitely not. Okay, and you know, we have a lot of geopolitical uh, things going on. 
you know, things between Russia, we've seen stuff between Russia and Ukraine, Russia and the United States, North Korea, Iran, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. That's a big issue. Uh, uh, we have th this global tension, um, uh, even like with the election um, hacking, that that really drives a lot of the conflict. So <clears throat> we suspect that the next major conflict, like someone mentioned cyber war <laughs> earlier, uh, we think it could impact physical, uh, which is uh, control systems, uh, or you know, cyber physical realm, even me medical, um, anything that affects uh, the physical world. Okay, so this is some recommendations. Um, how many of you that have OT, do, do you know if they have an ICS security policy at all? No? Okay, makes sense. Uh, if you don't have them, start thinking about it. Uh, we have free resources that's out there. NIST, anybody familiar with the NIST SB800 series? SB882, uh, excellent free resource. Uh, for starting your journey with control system security um, and you can dovetail your existing IT policies make a sub um, or make a whole nother policy but just have them tied together in some way so it, it covers all these different top topics I won't read the slide but uh, it covers everything from governance to incident response and disaster recovery you don't want your disaster recovery plan going, help, help. <laughs> you want the heroes to be able to do what they do, right? Um, Cross-training. So, how many people have been in a substation? When you go look at all this equipment that's in these racks, it doesn't look like anything like IT equipment at all. And then you take engineer, hey, I can remote in from my iPad. So having this cross-pollinization, like I mentioned earlier, go take a box of donuts um, to the engineers. Really focus on what their problems are, what their needs are, and you might be able to, um, you know, improve security. One instance is, is uh, your IT folks may have a gold image, right? Um, saying this is our standard corporate firmware uh, and software and all the things. Well, uh, we've run across where the good intentions of having a gold image, they didn't include anything that the, the manufacturing plant needed, like so none of the um, Rockwell automation software would run. So they couldn't do their job, so they had to do shadow IT. They had to go out and buy their own laptop, get the software, and do it themselves, okay? Mm -hmm. Just to make the plant run, because the plant manager is going to say, we need this to run don't care about IT if it comes down to it. Uh, so that's something to be aware of, some of the problems that we have. Which is a lesson. IT should stop saying no and figure out how to do it. Because they will get around you. And Right. And so one of the key ways to do this is have a test environment. Um, we, we come across uh, customers that have test environments and some that don't, and they you know put it put their test into production and let it soak for a little while, and then roll back if there's a problem. But the the best ones tend to have a full uh, test environment where they have at least a variation of everything that they have, like at least 80-20, you know, Pareto uh, rule there. So having that cross pollinization, planning for the worst. Engineers are good at this, by the way. Um, you have traditional DFIR tools. Um, anybody do DFIR in here at all? Forensics yeah. and incident response? Um, well, guess what? A lot of these don't work on control system stuff. Yeah. Except for the Windows stuff. If you have a Windows HMI, uh, Redline <coughs> and Volatility work great on that. Um, and we, uh, we've we actually installed our agent, uh, FireMix HX agent. We've installed that just fine on a control system, uh, at least if it was a newer well, not Windows XP, but if it's uh, you know Windows Server 2008 or newer, the work. Uh, so, what's the difference when you're doing an incident response for control systems? Um, you know, you have these eight steps. These are from the NIST uh, uh, document. 
uh, standard there. So first thing, assess the situation. How is the control system affected? Uh, you have a similar uh, thing. Uh, doing your triage is the same. Uh, now, define objectives. How to return the control system back to normal. The difference between IT and OT, you have physical processes. You can't just shut down something and restart it. You can't re just you know, reboot a plant. It has to be done in the right way. Um, collecting evidence. Um, remember the control system devices are based on real-time operating systems most of the time and not Windows or Linux. So uh, you may have to collect some of this forensics artifacts manually or using the tools that the vendors provided, like Siemens software or GE software or whatever. Um, they could dump memory. Uh, I teach a class on this. Um, we use the software to dump the memory that's from the factory, not using a Windows collection tool. Um, performing analysis. Um, there's no ICS-specific DFIR tools that'll do this. Um, been trying to help change that. Uh, I have some friends at uh, Volatility. Uh, Andrew Case, he spoke at the first um, uh, B-Sides Jackson, and they did a workshop around Volatility. I've been mean, encouraging someone, I don't have the skills to do it, to, to write a Volatility plugin for Windows Embedded, Linux Embedded, uh, VxWorks, and um, QNX. So those real-time operating systems. Um, and then communication is the same. Telling your boss what happened, telling upper management what happened, telling the lawyers what happened. Uh, may want to include control system vendors. That's, that part is going to be a key thing. Uh, remediation plan. When to regrain control and kick the bad guys out. You can't just re-image a PLC. Um, and you may not be able to change the backdoor password that was put in the firmware. So you're going to have to come up with other remediation steps uh, in case. Now, newer things that are VMware based, um, like Siemens and um, Ovation, Emerson Ovation, a lot of their systems run on VMs now in the server side, so you can um, <clears throat> throw up a new VM and be back to good, but uh, the hardware of the PLCs, you can't just read those. And then documentation, lessons learned, after action reports, that's all similar. Some of these collection tools, you have to use terminal. Anybody remember terminal? Yeah. <laughs> Serial cable, uh, putty, uh, notepad, and some of the software that's from the factories um, that make this stuff. So think about that. Put that in your plan. Um, and again, I know that the these different control systems that run these embedded operating systems have different file types. So, oh, guess what? Uh, QNX says EXT2 doesn't have EXT4, you know, so your file types may or may not be familiar with what you work with. <coughs> EXT4 would be nice because uh, it would show like the creation time of timestamps that are in the file system, but it just has these. And, you know, VxWorks is a proprietary, uh, you know, system, so you can't get a VM for it. You can get a VM for a, v, a Q and X, so I'm, I'm going to be doing some more research around that soon. Mm -hmm. um, we need more tools. We need more training. Um, we have training. Uh, SANS has training. Lots of other places have training around control systems, so think about that. Uh, we know what's coming. The more vulnerabilities that are out there, Leads to more exploits. There's lots of Metasploit exploits that's published for control systems. Uh, just leads to eventually um, we know what's happening. So, are we lucky that our control systems are not compromised all the time? Yeah. Everybody remember uh, this quote: "It's better to be lucky than good." <laughs> right. Uh, well, Voltaire flipped it on a script. Uh, Perfect is an enemy of good. So we need to just do the best we can with what we have. And now that you know about control systems, and if you have those at your job, uh, consider that in the in the tickle of your mind, do we have backups? Do we have an instant response plan? Who do we talk to at the plant or in uh, the HVAC if it's breached? You know. Have those little questions. Write them down on the notes. Get it in your email. You know, think about these things. Key takeaways: 
Uh, partner network if you can, uh, especially by default, a lot of these things may want to talk to public DNS servers. Um, if it's getting blocked by the firewall, you can probably uh, just disable it. Um, you can monitor, look for abnormal activity. Free tools like Security Onion. Now, Zeek, anybody familiar with Bro or Zeek? They just, uh, my colleague at, um, at Amazon, he used to work on my team, uh, Blake Johnson, that their team published some more uh, control system parsers for Zeek and they're on their uh, GitHub. So if you don't have an excuse, you have free tools. Um, knowing to harden the endpoints, uh, review what you already have, Windows event logs on control system HMIs. You can collect those. What are you doing with them? Or turn on the firewall logging. We have so many people that have firewalls that they don't turn on the logging and collect those logs. Uh, and don't forget about physical access. Uh, talk, you know, take take a look around and see what your weak points are. Well, I went to a control system not too long ago. Their control system engineer's office did uh, from the parking lot did not even have a doorknob on their door. Like you could just open the door to their office <laughs> from the parking. <laughs> so uh, I'm not bashing them. It's it's just something that the engineers didn't think about fixing. And so think about those things. Think maliciously. Think. Put on your red hard hat and walk around and see. Um, and then what to do when your incident occurs? Um, when you do your incident response plans or do your tabletops every year? Hopefully you do those every year. Think about control systems. Could that be a way that someone can attack our system? Or is it something we overlooked? Like, uh, for instance, finding a, a data chiller cooler you know, for the data center, the levers or whatever, Emerson Innovation or, or uh, whoever manufactures your... Is that publicly accessible? I found those chillers online. So if someone turns the air conditioning off to your data center, that's critical. It's going to get hot in there quick. Mm -hmm. So think about those kind of things that are out of band that may involve control systems like uh, lighting, power, backup generators, those things. And then practice. Got some resources here if you want to take a screenshot of that. Uh, some slide share, uh, that's the one I mentioned, how to get into ICS security. I uh, wrote a blog at uh, FireEye for <laughs> network security monitoring for control systems and incident response. Uh, again, lots of talks on this, so if you go on YouTube, you'll find more if you really want to get into it. Uh, we'd be glad to have you. So, have any questions? Okay. okay. I wanted to ask you, um, in your experience working with industries and um, doing evaluations, you mentioned that there's some systems that have built-in administrative logins and passwords that cannot be changed. How do these industries receive the risk associated with that when it comes to, hey, there's no other way around it except for replace it with something that doesn't have that in it? Well, there, there's more than one way to mitigate it. Um, some people put an intermediate firewall in between that checks to see, if, do they have that second factor? Do, are they coming from the right host? Um, uh, are they coming from, you know, are they using the right port protocol? So you can lock it down to, uh, like there's a industrial firewall that's um, manufactured and it'll say, allow remote desktop only from this host, only if they have two factor, only to this machine here. So- That's a lot cheaper. Yeah, so there, so there are, are creative ways Heck, I've seen um, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Monte uh, Elkins, he made a, a switch, like a network switch that had an egg timer that turned on the power for remote access. So he just, like, set it to 10 minutes, it turned on the power, uh, remote access only for 10 minutes, and then it cuts off. That's very crude and, you know, yeah. uh, MacGyver worthy there. But uh, GE. They have the same thing. They have a lockbox that actually turns on and off the remote access. Um, there are many other creative things that have happened. We've got lots of um, of those type stories in our industry. So, 
Yes. At Anything. some point, I would be like, why not just hex edit the firmware? <laughs> like, if it's that bad and impossible. You know. Well, then there's checksums that are in the other boot ROMs and chips yeah. on the board that you have to deal with. I tried it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get with the fender to get the new version. So. We've seen a lot of replacement of human machines, but a lot of it's integrating, like, just making a human job easier. Have you seen anything like OSHA components there in terms of uh, safety and computer interaction? Um, not directly with security. Um, OSHA, you know, they're they're concerned about uh, incidents and recordables, about um, you know. But I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. I've seen, I've seen like physical people that work machines like bypass security that was implemented there, and then get hurt in the process, and then OSHA steps in anyways, and they, they bypass the security mechanism. There, okay. So that's a good question. Um, I personally don't know the answer to that, but um, as an engineer, I'm a registered PE, so I now I want to go and study that case. I need to go so, like that. There are these safety boards besides OSHA. Well, like the like um, the investigation after like a gas. The explosion in a neighborhood. They have to go look and review the safety. Did someone go change something in the the valves? You know, was it a cyber uh, event that might have caused that? So, okay. The question is, uh, you know, we get a lot of vulnerability scanning anytime on the customer's network if they have some ICS. You know, we do something flaky today, so we shut down the door access system, or uh, you know, that's the thing that always breaks. So there's different vulnerability scanning tools for ICS. I mean, we use Polis, and we yep. typically Polis, Tenable, Rapid7, so yep. there are other tools specifically for ICS. The, uh, Tenable and Qualis, they actually have ICS modules in theirs. Um, uh, so you have to go look in the manual for, right. for those. Absolutely. Yeah, and you should be able to, uh, a lot of times, um, the more modern control systems, you can scan them, yeah. um, and they won't fall over, uh, generally. <laughs> Uh, the older stuff, definitely not. Yeah. Um, I've bricked several myself back, you know, in the early uh, 2010s um, by running Nmap the wrong way uh, because they were hand built stacks. They weren't off the shelf stacks that, for their networks. They were only designed to talk that one protocol or whatever, you know. So, but now um, scanning is more acceptable in control systems. So. Any other questions? I'm just the only I'm the only one that's holding you back till lunch. So lunch so. has been delivered in that corner there in the cafeteria break area. Um, before you go over there, we're, we're going to have some giveaways at the end of the day, and um, so grab a ticket here from Queen before you go, and um, probably the last break of the day, pull a ticket, pull the tickets for these nice prizes right here. Thank you. Mississippi Technology User Group for the That's awesome. Thank you. We really appreciate all the sponsors that made us happen. And Chris, thank you for your time and thank you so especially much. the last minute uh, pitching yeah. in there. So. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Hey, um, I know Homeland Security is kind of upping their support of, of systems, uh, especially infrastructure. Are there any grants or anything that you're aware of to kind of help bolster some of the security implementation or, uh, you know, for, just typically you don't have your IT department looking at ICS. Right. Uh, so there, there are absolutely, DHS has been doing it for a while. You might have heard of ICS Search. Um, that's run by DHS. It's kind of changed. It's not a really official mission anymore, but it still exists at Idaho National Labs. They're still doing research there. Uh, DARPA is doing uh, projects. There's a DARPA Radix project that's uh, was like a four-year project. It's still believe it's still going on to protect and defend the control systems for the power grid. Um, there was uh, a grant given to Nareka, which is um, rural power companies, uh, the association. I forget what it stands for off the top of my head, but they gave them a $15 million grant for security training for their folks. Wow. 
um, you know, when you think about the grid, it's not one grid. It's 3,000 companies making a quilt. Um, most of the companies, like Entergy and Southern Company, those are the investor-owned utilities. Those are the big dogs. Um, but there's 2,000 or more little bitty rural electric companies that only have 50,000, 20,000, 100,000 customers. And they don't have to follow the, the regulations like the bigger companies do uh, under NERC SIP. So they're starting to see more grants around this. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a lot more focus even on challenges. So remember Pwn to Own? Um, it's coming to control system. They're doing that in January. They're doing a Pwn to Own challenge in January. So there's a lot of uh, focus on tightening that up. Hey Chris, I was going to add something to that. So Homeland Security, there is the whole, I say all of their, their uh, preparedness grants, or the National Preparedness Initiative, National Preparedness Goal. Um, you know, it, it's, what, it's what the fire department has always used to get new turnout gear, new trucks, or uh, police department gets a little trick test. They, you know, there was a little part of that with the cybersecurity, and they used to give out about 2% of their funds for cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, this year they're really amping up the game on that because they realize what the cybersecurity means to, you know, to prepare this for critical infrastructure. So um, that that whole cycle has started, and statewide, you know, DHS has given money to the states to provide for cybersecurity policy. We tried for a grant a few years ago for the police department and failed because they're like they don't need a new firewall. Ten year old is fine, but let's get there. But they did at least get them off of Windows XP. They got them in computers. <laughs> So now they're like, no, no, bring those projects in, get SIM, firewall, antivirus, different 